country has been experiencing a near total internet shutdown. They're creating even more challenges in verifying the extent of the unrest. Freedom on the next report has labeled Pakistan as not free. Kashmir's been gagged, cut off from the rest of the world. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories that we're covering this week. If you can't beat them or suppress them, block them. In more and more countries, internet blackouts have become a fact of life. Syria's Bashar al-Assad and the interview an Italian broadcaster did not want its audience to see. Putting a face on fake news. Huzzah! Alas, why should you believe me? Deep fakes, like this faux version of Boris Johnson, are next level misinformation. And they want to impeach me. Dream on Nancy Pelosi. Ukrainian boy, the Trump impeachment story, set to music. For those of you watching this program online, imagine what an internet blackout would mean to you. Shut out of messaging sites, forced off social media, deprived of news, information, and the means to contact loved ones. Imagine you're Kashmiri, and the Indian government has left you in the dark for four months now. Or you're Iranian, and you've just experienced your most serious internet shutdown ever. Both of those shutdowns were imposed by governments, which said they were trying to prevent security threats. Their critics, human rights workers among them, say this is about silencing dissent, deliberately severing connections between people, a form of collective punishment. In fact, blackouts are now a standard feature in the authoritarian Internet playbook, an increasingly common response by governments that fear their grip on power is slipping. Flip a switch or two, and it's lights out for freedom of information and freedom of expression. Our starting point this week is the Indian-administered, blacked-out region of Kashmir. Two cities, two countries, two populations, large parts of which are politically restless, and two governments with the means to silence them. Srinagar, Kashmir, offline for four months now and counting, after the Modi government in New Delhi altered the constitution to revoke the region's autonomy, and the Iranian capital, Tehran, where net users were recently forced offline in the longest shutdown ever after economic protesters had taken to the streets. The authorities in Delhi and Tehran both had stories to control and used blackouts to do it, keeping their citizens in the dark, stopping them from speaking to the outside world. These are two very extended internet shutdowns that happen around a political crisis in the country. In the case of Iran, of course, this was around uh, economic protests that really uh, snowballed into large-scale anti-government protests. And in Kashmir, there have been protests and riots that have been happening in that sort of disputed territory for a while. What's marked these two shutdowns was just how long that they have lasted and sort of the, the humanitarian and economic costs that they have rotted on the, on the population. These internet shutdowns are also different from each other. Iran did block the internet entirely, but it did so for a relatively short period of time and was responsive to international pressure. Whereas in Kashmir, we're seeing a, an ongoing internet shutdown that's quite unique because of the fact that the vast majority of Indian internet users access the internet through mobile technologies. Between January and July of 2019, there were 128 internet shutdowns, uh, a large chunk of which occurred in India. Srinagar is the unofficial internet shutdown capital of the world. According to a Delhi-based nonprofit, the Software Freedom Law Center, this year alone, Narendra Modi's government has cut off mobile and internet services there 55 times. This latest blackout has lasted so long, Kashmiris have become unintended casualties of WhatsApp systems. Any account that has been inactive for 120 days is automatically deactivated by the company. And it doesn't stop there. 
what has been unprecedented is the is the scale of it we've seen that during this shutdown that even one way communication such as cable tv was being uh, was being shut i mean these are measures that were not even taken during the war so it's quite unprecedented and it's, uh, it's impacted different groups very severely uh, from students trying to access uh, examination material online from um, pharmacies trying to stock up on medicines from women trying to access justice mechanisms online legal advice is given online so an array of activities have been affected from education to medicine to just communication between family members Iran has shut down internet access far less often than India has but when it does the blackouts are comprehensive during protests in 2017 and 18 it blocked mobile networks and access to messaging apps the UN called the blackouts a serious violation of fundamental rights. When hikes in petrol prices led to new demonstrations last month and a security response in which more than 130 protesters have been killed, Iranians would have known what was coming. Within 24 hours, connectivity levels, which are usually at around 65% in Iran, fell to just 5%. That is how long it took the authorities to issue their orders to the various ISPs, Internet Service Providers. It wasn't a kill switch, didn't happen immediately. This was basically coordination across all the Internet Service Providers in Iran and getting them to turn them off. I was actually privy to some uh, leaked documents and you could see how the government had ordered these Internet Service Providers to go through a methodological plan of actually bringing the country back online to the international internet and they were telling them who to connect back online and these were you know the startups um, public institutions the research uh, institutes and then on to you know the broader public forcing ISPs to take orders is one way to control the internet but it's complicated building your own national intranet by limiting the number of information pipelines into and out of a country is another. China and North Korea both have national intranets, easily policed, and Iran is developing a model along the same lines. Intranets allow a government to unilaterally cut off its citizens from content the rest of the world sees. Intranets also spawn all kinds of mirror platforms, modeled on the likes of Facebook, YouTube, and WhatsApp, domestic versions of software or apps that those governments can control far more easily than the ones based in Silicon Valley. What China offers to the world is right now a model of the Internet where uh, it can be more state-centric. In fact, Chinese officials are inviting experts from different countries to China in order to better understand China's model of having a national internet. And what we're starting to see is in places like Russia, rather than sort of using the universal uh, internet infrastructure, they're creating their own infrastructure with a different set of protocols and sort of web addresses um, in order to, in some ways, secede from the global internet. When we see the internet sort of being broken up into many different internets, um, I think that the, the result for democracy and freedom isn't good. The idea for the National Information Network was conceived all the way back as early as 2005 in Iran. One of the nicknames that it got was Halalnet, and this was, you know, to describe how the immoral content that could be found on, you know, a free and open internet would naturally be censored, and there would be like a, a moral Islamic version of the internet. And it's really been intensified, however, under the Hassan Rouhani administration. We've also seen alternatives to platforms like YouTube, which are censored. So the Iranian version of YouTube is Aparat, and it's actually quite popular. On internet shutdowns, the position of the UN's Office for Human Rights is clear. They are a breach of basic human rights, freedom of expression, freedom of information that Kashmir is a form of collective punishment without even a pretext of a precipitating event, that Iranians have been deprived not only of a fundamental freedom, but also basic access to essential services. 
and one thing that governments might want to ask themselves before they go down this path, do internet shutdowns even work? There is zero evidence to prove that internet shutdowns are actually effective in quelling unrest or violence. In fact, what researchers from Stanford have found that when you implement these kind of uh, internet shutdowns, that it promotes violent action because violent sort of mobilization requires less coordination and effort in that sense than non-violent coordination. With the information vacuum, there is more misinformation that's being spread. So it honestly takes away from the cause more than it really contributes to effectuating any peace in the situation. I think in this day and age, given the ways in which the internet is utilized for everything from banking and economic services to personal communications and everything in between, um, we do have to consider access to the internet as a human right. We should not allow governments like Iran's to restrict access for its citizens. People need to be able to communicate, they need to be able to access services, and so, you know, shutting down the entire internet should absolutely be off limits. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Johanna Hoos. Joe, we've seen presidents and prime ministers complain about interviews before. It might be the questions asked or the way the interview's been edited. But Syria's Bashar al-Assad is accusing a broadcaster of censorship. Isn't it supposed to be the other way around? Yes, and this is a bit of a strange one, Richard. Assad is talking about RAI, which is Italy's public broadcasting network. Now, on November 26th, he gave an interview to Monica Maggioni, who is the CEO of RAICOM, which is a company that distributes RAI's content. The interview was scheduled to be broadcast a week later on Rai News 24 and on Syrian State TV simultaneously. But on the day of the broadcast, Rai asked for a delay because, as it turns out, none of Rai's channels had commissioned the interview. So how did Maggioni and Assad end up in the same room? Had she gone rogue? And who came up with this idea for the simultaneous broadcasting of this interview? Well, that's where the story gets a little confusing. Maggioni used to be Rai News 24's editor, but no longer has a journalistic role in the network. She's in distribution. She refuses to answer any questions about the affair, including who at Rai actually signed off on the interview. But the Italian media have reported that this may have come down to editorial disagreements or ethical ones. A Syrian state TV, which has a much better idea of who it takes its orders from, put the piece out. It's a softball interview, nothing challenging, no particularly incisive questions. Ending on a very personal note, Mr. President, do you feel like a survivor? Uh, if you want to talk about national war like this, where every, nearly every city has been harmed by terrorism or external uh, bombardment or anything like this, uh, you can talk about the Syrians as survivors. Uh, but again, I think this is human nature to be survived. You, and you yourself? I'm part of those Syrians. I cannot be... Assad has issued a statement calling this another example of Western attempts to hide the truth on the situation in Syria. Okay, thanks, Joe. Famous people will say just about anything these days. Who knew that Kim Kardashian has admitted to manipulating public data for money? I feel really blessed because I genuinely love the process of manipulating people online for money. Or that Mark Zuckerberg has copped to abusing the private information of Facebook users. Imagine this for a second. One man with total control of billions of people's stolen data. All their secrets, their lives, their futures. Convinced? Don't be. Those are deep fakes, videos produced through the use of artificial intelligence, melding images and sound, appearing so real it's difficult to tell that they're fake. The vast majority of deep fakes currently online focus on celebrities, lots of fake porn, putting one head on someone else's body because that's where the money is. But the bigger concern is this. Deep fakes could be used to spread misinformation, mess with politics, manipulate electorates by fooling journalists and voters alike. Seeing used to be believing, but the day is coming where the veracity of video could be completely up for debate. And if you think that Facebook and Google et al. struggle to deal with fake news now, does anyone really believe they're equipped or even inclined to handle deep fakes? The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on a future where we won't be able to trust our own eyes. <laughs> December 2018, Gabon. 
President Ali Bongo has all but disappeared from the public sphere and people are growing restless. There are whispers that he is incapacitated, maybe even dead. The president's spin doctors need to silence the rumor mill. They promise he will address the country in a New Year's speech. Gabonais, Gabonais, si votre bien-être me importe, notre vivre ensemble me préoccupe, me préoccupe tout autant. But something about the video doesn't add up. Bongo's eyes barely move or blink. He stares off camera. His body and hands seem rigid, unnatural. The public is not convinced. The video looks fake, begging the question, what if seeing isn't believing? What if seeing is deceiving? Off the back of this, yeah, there was a, an attempted uh, military coup. This video actually was used as some people as almost like vindication for their suspicions, saying, ah, no, we were right, see, because this is definitely fake. This is a deep fake. Je continuerai à mettre toute mon énergie et toutes mes forces so you can see how deep fakes could be very, very easily used in political controversies and things like this. Deep fake face graphs, body transfers or voice imitations can be used to make people appear to say things they never said and do things they never did. You ever wonder why I'm so popular? Because of my big brain? Maybe. Realistic fakes can be used by just about anyone with an agenda or an axe to grind to conceivably help rig an election, destabilize markets, or start a war. For now, the target is mostly women. A staggering 96% of deepfakes are non-consensual pornography, produced by misogynist hobbyists in the shadier margins of the internet. They've become big money makers. It's uh, women's bodies, uh, identities um, and rights that are being transgressed and oppressed basically by quite a small but quite a prolific body of actors that are basically taking famous celebrity female actors faces and basically transplanting those into pornography scenes and there are huge websites that profit millions of dollars from displaying and sharing and streaming these uh, kind of uh, deep fake um, you know pieces of pornography. This is primarily targeting uh, Western celebrities although our research found uh, a third of uh, targets were from not were not from Western countries, um, and even more surprisingly, perhaps a quarter were of South Korean K-pop stars. And there are also a number of websites springing up, um, which are dedicated to creating deepfake pornography that run things like polls: "Who do you want us to to create a deepfake pornographic video of next?" All with advertising, which shows that this isn't just kind of some sort of hobby anymore. This is a potentially lucrative business. Fake content exists on a spectrum. Shallow fakes or cheap fakes are far more crude. They typically rely on deceptive editing, slowing down or speeding up video, maybe a bit of green screen fakery. If you've used a filter on Snapchat or TikTok, you've produced something on the deep fake spectrum. They're freely available to any clown with a phone. We can think of the Jim Acosta video from last fall, so November 2018, in which uh, the footage was changed as it sort of morphed across social media. The frame dropping um, within those videos made it look like, you know, these actions were much more forceful than they actually were in real life. And then we have the Nancy Pelosi video from last summer as an example of slowing down existing video to make it look like she was, you know, speaking very slowly to the point of slowing her words and, you know, appearing drunk. So it's really sad. And here's the thing. And I told this to the room. Even a cheap fake can make headlines and have a political impact. And in this new era of democratized access to video synthesis, deep fakes aren't all that hard to produce. So what happens when those with technical know-how get in on the act? Digital artist Bill Posters has done exactly that, harvesting the biometric data of British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and leader of the opposition Jeremy Corbyn, creating synthesised video of both men endorsing each other for Prime Minister. And back Boris Johnson to continue as our Prime Minister. It's a statement on some of the most pressing issues of our time data, our right to privacy, and as British voters went to the polls, the integrity of the democratic process. My friends, I wish to rise above this divide and endorse my worthy opponent, the 
Right Honourable Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister of our United Kingdom. What are the elements of the video that you'd be looking for as kind of telltale signs or that would alert you to the fact that it's not real? That's one of the real kind of like key reasons why I'm creating this type of artistic content. It's, it's media literacy essentially, right? It's to raise awareness to these powerful new technologies and techniques of image manipulation uh, and understand the type of content that we're, that we're viewing. So what I'd be looking for is, um, for a traditional deep fake, uh, is the whole facial region, okay? Um, quite often when the new face uh, model is applied, um, it's always done with a mask and you may see some slight colorations around the edges uh, of the frame of the face in particular. You know, we're looking for slight differences in skin tone things like that. Um, we're also looking about the, the facial proportions. Is there some kind of um, kind of element of the facial proportions that just seems offset or unnatural? But it's in increasingly difficult to, to notice and to spot and interpret this type of content. Tackling those risks is considerably more difficult because of how videos proliferate across closed messaging apps like WhatsApp, without any scrutiny or moderation. And it's not just deepfake disinformation delivered to our phones. What of state actors, bad ones, specialists in manipulative propaganda and foul play? What if it were possible to hack into satellite imagery and synthetically create a missile silo where one does not exist? Or concoct troop movements where they do not exist? And what happens if video evidence upon which criminals are prosecuted and juries are swayed becomes inadmissible in court? If moving images become so discredited, they become unusable. It's important to remember that, you know, deep fakes are simply a new technological capacity to um, to generate uh, different types of misinformation. And they really highlight the fact that within our current uh, information and communication environment, there is no one who is able to effectively uh, rein in misinformation. What we're seeing now are huge transnational global architectures. This whole kind of digital influence industry that's emerged over the last 10, 12 years or so that allow the transmission of information uh, instantaneously to audiences. The threat really is more insidious with regards to the surveillance architectures that um, some scholars today are calling the, the infrastructures of surveillance capitalism. We're living in an increasingly um, synthetic world. Um, whether that's the smartphone uh, camera that you have, which pr uh, does computational photography, whether that's um, Siri's voice on your phone, or perhaps even Google Duplex, their new voice assistant, which is meant to sound indistinguishable from a real person. Not all of these are bad, um, and we need to have nuance to the discussion around deepfakes and synthetic media in general um, to make sure that we're not kind of demonizing all uses of this technology, but it is also very important by people creating those forms of technology to make sure that they are not open to abuse. Seeing has never really been believing. We all have blind spots in our perception. The brain constantly chooses the most likely interpretation of what we see. Deepfakes muddy the waters even further. Their existence is enough to make us doubt what we see. For as much as they make the fake appear real, so too can the real be dismissed as fake. And finally, having first raised the prospect of impeaching Donald Trump before he was even sworn in as president, the opposition Democrats have finally rolled out the articles of impeachment that the process requires. The allegations that the former reality TV star tried to coerce a Ukrainian government led by a comedian into investigating his potential rival for the White House, Joe Biden, provide online satirists with plenty of material. Now, the fact that the following music video called Ukrainian Boy was produced by a site called Joe is a mere coincidence. Joe is a British site, which describes the video this way. President Trump and U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi transform into Kanye West and Estelle to deliver a banger for the ages. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Just love the phony witch I found On the lecture in a fear and rounds I gotta send a tweet right now Distract from what's been going down Give them the run around Blend with the Dems and the fake news crowd They wanna impeach me Dream on Nancy Pelosi Breaking up the transcript of the policy Investigating leaks